everyone, today I've got the amazing Peter Woods Brierson with us. Peter, please could you introduce yourself and share how you were drawn to Avalon? Yep, hello there. Um, so a lot of you know me, some of you don't, that'll be a surprise for you later on. Um, so I've been in Glastonbury for best part of 20 years now, give or take, um, and it's the first place I've personally chosen to live. Previous places it's been work related or marriage related or parent related, but I chose to move to Glastonbury, I chose to live here, and more importantly, I've chosen to stay here. And yeah, Glastonbury, Avalon, you know, there are some crazy stuff happening in this town, both good and bad. There are some great people, there are some bad people. There's some amazing spiritual connection here. There's amazing magics. And there's stuff that's a little bit tourism, a bit boring, a bit mundane. But I choose to live in this town for all of that, right? Um, it, I've not found anywhere else, and I've traveled the world, that hasn't got this same really interesting balance. There's normal, natural people here. There's builders and tradesmen. There's spiritual people, there's clairvoyance, there's farmers. It's a really interesting mix of people. But ultimately, this island, this sacred Isle of Avalon, it is the most captivating magical place. And for anyone who's lived here for more than a couple of years will echo this sentiment in that this island amplifies you. Right? If you walk into town in a good mood, then you're damn near or orgasmic. If you walk into town in a bad mood, then by the end of the high street, you're slitting your wrists. Right? So this town amplifies, and therefore, if you can actually lock onto something that you love doing, and you love doing it in this town, or your base is this town, right? whether it's conference-based, goddess-based, business-based, whatever it is, it will amplify you. And sometimes to a detriment where when you leave this town, you realise actually here I was amazing. When I go to somewhere else, I'm not so amazing. What's happened? And that every time it's because you've gone somewhere else thinking it's all about you. But actually, you need to maintain that connection to Avalon, to the island, whether that's through the lady, whether that's through the ground, handful of dirt in your pocket, whatever it is, right? And wherever I go, in, all around the world, I will always take some Avalon with me, right? And people always laugh, why are your boots always muddy? Because they're covered in Avalon all the time. <laughs> Okay. Um, I've always been an outdoors person, right? So ever since I was young, you know, the indoors where you, was where you ate and slept, outdoors where you did everything else. Um, and being in Avalon now, I'm no different. So you'll, you'll rarely see me at indoor ceremonies, at indoor events, because it's not my connection. I, I, I know, understand the purpose for it, and most people don't like getting wet or cold or sunburnt or whatever it is, but for me, the island is, is the magic. And being out in nature, being out on her, and in her and around her. And right now I'm going to do a theatrical pause. Lots of birds, right? Lots of wind, right? Right now I can feel the wind going across my neck, right? I can see it all around me, the grass just shimmering, right? That is, for me, without being a little bit poetic, that is the hairs of her body just wiggling. That's the goosebumps just kind of tingling around me, right? So for me, being in Avalon, on Avalon, is how I express myself. And over the years, I've been a part of amazing projects. I've helped build and change the landscape physically in this town. I've helped create things and do stuff. But more importantly, I like being here. And I'm an advocate for living here, an advocate for working here. And I'm an advocate for the Goddess Conference, the Goddess Community, the Goddess Temple, and all that kind of stuff. But equally, people who want to come here because they're into something totally different, fine. It's a, it's a place where you can come and you can express who you are and what you are. And more importantly, the, the island, the town, the, the, the fellowship of the, of the community will help support you as you find yourself. But equally, if you come here just to take, if you come here with a pure, I'm going to come to a Glastonbury, run a workshop, take all the money and run away, right? The town energetically doesn't support you. And the amount of people I hear, oh, I've, I tried doing workshops in Glastonbury and they don't really work. That's because they've come in for a day, tried to fly it, run away, and the town doesn't gel so much, right? If you want to come here to receive personal development, personal learning, personal healing, while sharing your gift, while sharing your mission, absolutely welcome, right? If you're coming here just to take, right, then Glassman will take from you, because that's the intention you came to town with you, right? And you'll leave a, a dried up little husk. <laughs> um, on hindsight, I think I've had some, some of my most amazing lessons in Avalon. Um, so I moved here 20 odd years ago um, for love. Um, and like many relationships that happened in this, t in, in this town, you know, once we, once we came, to, we, were, we were both living here, you know, that love got a lot of petrol tipped on it, right? And um, yeah, the relationship got burnt up pretty quick. <laughs> um, but in that, the life lessons came from it, you know? And everything I am today and everything I am and what I've, what I've built and achieved and who I am has come from moving here. If I'd stayed living with somewhere else, and if I stayed in, in those old jobs, then I would have stayed as that person. I probably wouldn't have evolved or grown or been who I was. So I'm, I'm much happier with who I am now 
you know, and if I could go back to when I was in my early 20s and I first, first was thinking of moving to Glastonbury, you know, you know, I'm actually happy with who I've turned into, if that makes sense. You know, and I would challenge most people to ask that question. Go back 20 years, you know, at a big life-changing moment, not teenage stuff, kind of early 20s stuff, big life-changing moment. Are you now proud of the person who you've turned yourself into, right? And although, yes, I could be a bit richer and I could be a bit thinner, you know, and I could have a bit more hair, I'm sure, right? But actually, you know, I'm actually happy with who I've become, right? There are people in town who don't like who I've become because I happily tell them they're wrong or they're right or I'm happy to stand my ground and, and answer my own, my, my own heart. But actually that's part of this town. It's given me the confidence to actually stand up and say who you are and what you are. But more importantly, it's helped me understand how to deliver it. So years ago when I first kind of was thinking about moving here and I, I had my hands in a whole variety of different spiritual pies and I was involved in all the different communities and I was so cocky and cocksure right i'm um, still spiritual still connected to my heart but ultimately i thought i was right in all situations and didn't really care who i offended and what i've learned by being in this town it's so easy to offend people if i'm so smart i need to learn how to not to do that because otherwise i'm the one that's being stupid if i can't pitch my thought my feelings my heart in a way that they, they can understand then actually i'm at fault and if i hadn't been surrounded by so many people in glastonbury you know over the years i wouldn't have learned that lesson you know so I, i'm a much happier more well-rounded person uh, when we say the words defined feminine or goddess what does she mean so <clears throat> over my life i have worked with different um, aspects of divinity both male and female um and while being male i've often found myself um easier to connect to the female energies right maybe that's because i'm heterosexual and i find the female energies attractive maybe right maybe it's because as a man and this next bit is controversial so bear with me <laughs> maybe as a man maybe it's easier for me to love the goddess because i don't have to love the woman inside me first maybe don't know um the audience freaking out now but <laughs> but yeah I, so i've worked with a variety of different female divinities over the years and the one that has kind of been there all the way through and the one that has really kind of held that capacity you know, ha has been the lady and while nowadays we refer to it as Nolivar or the Lady of Avalon you know um, the lady as a very simplistic term is something that came to me a long time ago whether I was working with Hecate or with Aphrodite or other different deities or Egyptian deities that whenever I got, got to know them lady is what I end up referring to them as you know and it whereas interesting in, in each of those different teachings they're, they're, they're different different cultures lady was never a shorthand if that makes sense, within those different uh, pantheons. So, you know, for years I've worked with the lady just with different hats on, with different masks on, right? Um, and some of them are more devout followers would argue that she's the same lady throughout all those areas wearing different masks. And there's a lot of controversy around that, you know. But for me, she has taught me, guided me, held me, kicked me, laughed at me, you know, watched me as I've tripped over, you know, and giggled as I've asked for a hand and said, no, it's your own fault, pick yourself up, you know. And I've had that relationship. I've, I've very much, from day one, the thing that really captivated me about the kind of, um, what could be loosely umbrella termed as a, as a pagan path, is that as pagans or neo-pagans or priestesses, priests, we work with divinity. We're not just working for them. We're not just servants to them. We work with them, side by side. And you know, lots of other philosophies, Druidism, Wiccan, you know, even the, even the Kabbalistics to a point will say the same thing. But within the Avalonian tradition, I've really felt it, right? And when you call them in, you feel them standing beside you. You feel them sweeping over you, you know? And that's very different to the ones where you have to almost order them to come into you, or you have to kind of beseech them to surround you. Whereas here, you call them, they turn up, right? Um, so yeah, so for me personally, you know, it, the lady, has really been there throughout my entire time um, and I'm in my own head my own mind I look around for other people who join the tradition and I've quite deliberately not followed some of my fellow brothers in trying to become more effeminate in my worship right and I can put a girly voice on you know and I can you know be all prim and proper and I can dance around like a like like a ballerina if need be right I look like a drunk elephant but I can do it <laughs> okay um, but for me learning and being loved by the goddess and loving the goddess in return is not trying to be the goddess is not trying to be more effeminate it's actually trying to be more who i am deep down and sometimes that creates rifts because sometimes in a in a community that's mostly female and within the men who are in this community a lot of the men are either um they hold back their masculinity 
or they don't want to show it in, from fear of being rejected, right? It's a challenge. It's a risk, you know. Um, you know, and you'll you'll see it if it's in a, if in a, in a ceremony and you have thirty odd women and they're all singing and dancing and shrieking and having a good time, and one man growls or roars, right? It will it will change the energy, right? Not as good or bad, but it will change it because that roar comes with associations to the masculine, associations to potential trauma and, and this kind of stuff. And a lot of men will choose not to. Uh, rock that boat as it were and I'm not saying I, I turn around roaring you know I haven't got a line on cassette player in my pocket you know but the idea is that I am who I am and I, I've always been this person right and I've really enjoyed over the time meeting people who by their own um, introductionary right hate men right and I've really enjoyed meeting those people and proving to them that you can hate some men and some men are assholes absolutely I've met them right but actually there are some men who are nice right some de deities right are lovely and some deities are right bastards right so actually you know within <laughs> within our society within our pantheons within our traditions you know everything isn't light and everything isn't love there's a balance yeah um so for me loving the goddess is very much about being in love with the goddess and knowing and feeling her presence throughout my entire life and as i've gone into through the priestess training i call it a priestess training because when i did it priests weren't really named you know and I dedicated as a priestess you know um, and the training very much for me is still female based even though men are so, I've always been welcome it's still female focused as it should be because that's the nature of it you know and I'm very honored to have what I refer to as learnt women's mysteries while doing the priestess training right and yes I, I'm a priest if, if I'm asked I'm a priest but I use the term in, intermittently you know and if, if we had a non-gendered term right that would be far more in, intelligent than constantly being a, trying to word associate to what gender it is right um, but for me I'm very proud of who I am I'm very proud of what I've done and I encourage anyone else to explore the path and it's not for everyone you know I've um, introduced people to it and it's some people have loved it gone for it and I've helped them to kind of come through the system other people have tried it and they're not ready for that level of personal progression they're not level to actually they're not ready to actually face and meet a goddess on equal terms right and being called out for their bullshit and that's that's scary you know So I'm going to kind of answer that in reverse. <clears throat> so how does living in Avalon empower me in my sovereignty? So it empowers me to be who I am. It empowers me to look at things impartially. It empowers me to check, to sense check and have a goddess on my shoulder, as it were, or with my arm locked, to, in essence, ask questions and make sure everything is as it should be, right? So I feel totally empowered to make free-formed but informed with the lady on my shoulder judgments and ideas and philosophies um, I feel empowered to stand for my own beliefs I feel empowered to challenge the status quo I feel empowered to challenge people within our own community if I feel what's being said is right or wrong the term sovereignty I think has been um, dare I say bastardized a little bit too many political groups have tried to grab it and twist it and turn it I mean and if you look at the Oxford English dictionary, English dictionary there's so many different versions of what sovereignty technically means right is it supreme power is it being except from um, exempt from control of society's power is it being in charge of a political group well I'm not in charge of a, of a political group I'm not exempt from political power because I'm in charge of my own areas and my own things my own world um, do I have supreme power over myself to a point, but I'm also living in a society that, that influences me? So I don't really relate to the word sovereignty in this respect, but I do relate to the, to the idea that we work with a divinity, a lady, a goddess, right, who in her own aspect has a sovereignty. And I believe that I'm living on the island of Avalon that actually echoes her sovereignty, right? The fact that this community, Goddess Conference, Goddess Community, the Temple, and the whole Goddess Movement, is a expansion and echo of the lady's sovereignty, right? And that's the clever bit, and I think that might be lost on some people because we're too busy obsessing with the political piece, right? Um, and if you look at what's happened within the goddess movement, right, versus other uh, spiritual groups, right? The goddess movement has been going publicly for, for 20, 30 years, right? It has been um, echoed throughout the world with different conferences. We, we have temples, we have houses, we have communities, right? And although there's the occasional rupture, there's the occasional political fallout that happens with any social group, right? But 
it's a group that's continued to move and it's continued to evolve, right? And I think a really important part of what I refer to as her divine sovereignty and how I relate to that is I'm a part of the movement that is evolving, right? We're not trying to do it how we did it 50 years ago. We're not trying to do it how the ancient people did it 3,000 years ago, right? Because we can't. We don't live in those same times. We don't have those same pressures, right? We don't have the Romans banging down our door, as it were, right? There's not a risk of a bunch of barbarians burning down the temple anymore, right? But we live in a modern society with a modern, with a modern goddess who's working with us and, and vice versa. So that sovereignty is actually having the power to live with the goddess, to live on Avalon, right? To not be bound by other society's rules except for the rules and concepts that we create within our own community and to me that's the avalonian sovereignty and again your true self today may not be your true self in a year's time and i'd argue anyone who is exactly the same today as they were five years ago has wasted five years so actually your true self should be in a constant state of anal anal analytical reflection because we are always growing and we are always are always evolving or at least we should be <laughs> Thank you for your time and we'll see you at the conference. Very welcome, see you soon, thank you.